Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Road to Zero, Decarbonizing Public Transport in Northern Ireland with TransLink. I am Geraldine Noé. I am Head of Environment at Business in the Community Northern Ireland, and I am delighted to welcome you all and our guest speakers uh, this afternoon. So this webinar is the third in our series uh, NIK Studies on Climate Action. You can find the other webinars from this spring series and the ones we hosted in December on our YouTube channel. These uh, series of webinars are part of our Business Action on Climate campaign, where we want to challenge and support all businesses in Northern Ireland to address the climate emergency. Wherever your organization is on its climate journey, you can sign our Climate Action Pledge and uh, commit to reducing your greenhouse gas emissions and join a growing movement of local companies committed to act in collaboration on this crucial issue. And if what I've just said doesn't make sense or you don't know where to start, do get in touch with us uh, because we have a range of support available to help you get started on your climate journey. So back to today's webinar, we are here together for 45 minutes, so I hope you have a nice cup of tea with you. I am delighted to welcome our guest speakers from our climate champion organization, TransLink, today. So we have Ian Campbell, Director of Service Operations, uh, Brian Elliott, Senior Program Manager, and Sarah Simpson, Operations Business Change Manager. And they will be telling us about the exciting journey TransLink is on to decarbonize public transport in Northern Ireland. After their presentation, we will have time for some questions from the audience, so please do type them in the questions box that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and uh, if you encounter any, any technical problem, just please let us know in the chat box as well. So unfortunately, the webcams of our guest speakers don't work today, so uh, that will be uh, just uh, uh, an audio webinar. Uh, think of it as a as a podcast, really. Um, but uh, we should be we should be fine, and and we'll we'll uh, get started. So, just to start with, I'd like to invite you all to answer a quick quiz, a quick question. Um, as is the tradition for us uh, at Business in the Community and those webinars. So how much carbon dioxide can you save on your journey's footprint if you choose to ride the bus instead of driving your car? So is it 50%, 75%, 90% or 99%? So you should be able to vote in a few seconds. Ah, nope, I think we have a problem with the poll. So let me, let me give you the answer. And this one is quite a complicated one because it, well, of course, it depends on what car you drive. It depends on the bus you are riding and it depends on how full this bus is. But just to give you some average figures, um, driving a mile in an average UK car at 36 miles per gallon is has a footprint of 530 grams of CO2 equivalent, 530 grams, okay? And traveling a mile by bus, that's six grams of CO2 equivalent in a full 90-seater electric bus in the UK again, 46 grams of CO2 equivalent on a half full uh, diesel hybrid bus. So you would get a, a reduction of between 90, 99% of your carbon footprint. Of course, if you're driving alone in a double-decker bus uh, with just a driver uh, in the in the countryside, then then the footprint is much much higher. Um, but just yeah, the, the the take on this is public transport usually is better than than driving your own car, especially if you are alone in the car. So I'm sorry the poll didn't work today. Um, but uh, hopefully that will give you a bit of information. Um, just, yes, just so so the, if you want to find an, an additional resource on this and, the, and a, an amazing book to read is uh, um, How Bad Are Bananas? The Carbon Footprint of Everything uh, by Mike Berners-Lee and it's just mind-blowing, really, really interesting read. So I would recommend uh, 
it to you if you want to learn more about the carbon footprint of stuff and services. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome our first speaker. I think it's Ian starting uh, and will be presenting us uh, the road to zero and TransLink's journey on uh, decarbonizing public transport in Northern Ireland. Ian, you are very welcome. Thanks very much, Geraldine, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to come and join us this afternoon. So look, this afternoon, uh, we're going to give you a very quick overview of some of the things we're doing to, as Geraldine's already outlined, to decarbonize, or to put it another way, to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emission uh, position within TransLink by 2040. So after a short introduction and telling you a little bit about our, our strategic approach, I'll hand over to Brian Elliott and Sarah Simpson, who are going to give you an overview of a very exciting program, which is uh, working towards placing 100 zero emission buses onto the streets of Northern Ireland over the next year. Next slide, please, Claire. So a little bit about TransLink. Uh, TransLink is one of the largest employers in Northern Ireland. We uh, employ just over 4,000 staff directly and supporting over 6,000 other jobs in the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, we operate over 13,000 bus and train services every day, and that carries some uh, 300,000 passengers per day. We maintain a fleet of 1,400 buses and trains that collectively do over 44 million miles per annum. Um, and we also are responsible for the public transport network uh, and infrastructure in Northern Ireland. So that, that uh, we would own, maintain and operate over 80 bus and rail stations, um, 8,000 park and ride uh, spaces, and we maintain over £3 billion of railway assets. Next slide, please, Claire. <coughs> Excuse me. So when, when we took a step back and looked at the whole issue of, of, of where we were going in terms of climate change and, and some of the other factors, we, we had to consider the need for change. So if you look today, what, are, what are, is the need for change, both in terms of, of transport, but specifically public transport? Well, we're all aware of the huge impact COVID-19 has had on the health of the nation and of course, the Northern Ireland economy. But arguably, we face an even greater threat across the world, and that's of global warming and the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, air pollution in Northern Ireland has a significant impact or adverse impact on public health. And in effect, you combine COVID, global warming and air pollution. In effect, that is the dynamic for change in terms of public transport. We would see that public transport very much is part of the solution. Firstly, public transport is safe. Um, we do clean uh, our vehicles with antiviral chemicals. We actually swab test our fleet and our stations. And we're clear based on work that we have done with public health agency and Department of Health that actually the risk of transmission on public transport is exceptionally low in terms of COVID. But public transport is also clean. Um, Geraldine, I'll have to supply you with some better data than that. Our view is 50% is an absolute minimum based on actual uh, passenger journey figures compared with that of car. So public transport is a far lower carbon solution than the private car, but it's, it also is a lower pollutant. Um, and even today, the, the diesel buses that we have driving around the streets of Belfast are five per, five per, or uh, five times less polluting than the than the private cars that you could buy on a, on out of a, a, a car sale room today. So basically, a modern a modern diesel bus is five times more efficient from a, a pollutant point of view compared with a modern day car. And that's because of the quite significant uh, European standards that were applied to the bus industry in terms of reducing pollutants. Next slide, please. So taking the need for change, uh, we took a step back and we actually set about working up a strategy. And we call it our climate positive strategy. Now, we were delighted uh, earlier this year to uh, sign up to the Business in the Community Climate Action Pledge, 
I'm also pleased to uh, identify that 50 that that 50 percent reduction in our current greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 now forms a key element of our climate strategy. And I would encourage anybody on listening to this call who hasn't got uh, as their business hasn't signed up to the, that climate pledge to seriously consider it, because it does focus the mind and it will determine. Uh, a pathway of how you go from where you are today to how you can achieve that by, by 2030. And there's a lot of supporting information available. But beyond that, we would say it's, there's an imperative to get public transport and the public transport network to net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. That's uh, eliminating uh, greenhouse gas emissions on our network. Um, and then beyond that, to become actually climate positive and going beyond a net zero position. So our strategy, I'm not going to cover the strategy, but the strategy is split into three key priorities. Greener vehicles, that's the buses and trains. Greener infrastructure and our greener business, focusing on biodiversity, ensuring our business is sustainable and encouraging active travel. Next slide, please. So translating that into what we're doing on our fleet, which is really the introduction to what Brian and Sarah are going to talk about. 91% of the energy we use in TransLink goes on our buses and train uh, fleets. So therefore, to deliver a net zero position by 2040, we have to eliminate zero emissions on our fleet by that, by that date. As an interim point, we have identified a, a procurement pathway and a technological roadmap that by 2030, all our bus services in Belfast and Derry stroke London Derry will be uh, zero emission. So that will be operated, for example, by battery electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles. The vehicles that we have in service today are of various ages. And some of the older fleets, we are not going to wait until they're due to be uh, replaced in terms of our um, or of our clean air agenda. So as part of this fleet strategy, we are retrofitting all buses that will uh, be operating in Belfast and Derry and across the Gold Line network. They will be retrofitted to achieve at least a Euro 6 uh, emission standard by 2022. So by the end of next, next year, we will have one of the cleanest fleets uh, in operation in Europe. Our current electricity supply, the supply of our, our facilities, which is about 9% of the energy we use, is currently procured from 100% renewable sources. Last year, we introduced the first hydrogen uh, fuel cell bus into passenger service, and that's the first double-deck fleet to enter service on the island of Ireland. Next year, we'll see the introduction of the first electric bus uh, on the streets of Belfast, and we're currently working up a decarbonisation pathway for the rail network which is likely to include options such as electrification or partial, partial electrification of the rail network. So that really sets the scene. And I'm now going to hand over to Brian Elliott, who's going to tell you about the exciting project that we have to introduce 100 zero emission uh, buses onto the streets of Northern Ireland. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, as program manager for the zero emission fleet, I have a uh, task to introduce the 100 zero emission buses that are currently in order, uh, the in initial outworkings of the strategy that Ian has, has just uh, outlined there. So the, the initial order will be for 80 battery electric buses and 20 fuel cell electric buses. Now, obviously, those vehicles uh, are different to what we currently operate and no longer can you just pull the bus in and fill it up with diesel that, that will no longer be an option so we will be looking to bring along the associated infrastructure to uh, manage the introduction of the fleet and to make sure the vehicles can run properly so in case of the battery electric vehicles we will need uh, uh, battery chargers uh, bigger than the, the mobile phone charger you'd see at home these are standalone units that would will be dotted around the yard. You might have seen similar around some of the car parks uh, and data central station. If you've been there, you'll see them uh, there. And the hydrogen refueling station in order to fuel up our fuel cell uh, buses. So uh, both vehicle types will also require an element of, of maintenance. That's different than we currently operate. Uh, there'll be 
issues around how we work safely on the vehicles and obviously the facilities will have to be adopted to uh, meet the requirements to, to work on the various uh, vehicle types, particularly around the hydrogen vehicle. Um, associated with the infrastructure then, we will have to have a new fuel supply. So currently, as we said earlier, we need diesel for buses. Going forward, we'll need electricity and we'll need hydrogen. Um, and those two, two elements will be totally new and part of the, the program to uh, introduce these new feet. We'll have to include that. The target date for the introduction of the first 100 vehicles into the zero emission fleet will be spring of 2022, so not very far away in, in project terms. Next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of, of how we see the battery electric as a system. So the, the battery electric vehicle obviously requires electricity to charge uh, the batteries. Uh, we, uh, we have standalone chargers in, in the yard and they're fed from our, our grid supply. And as Ian has identified earlier, we have 100% renewable energy contract and, and we see that as being critical to the rollout of zero emission. There's no point in us operating zero emission fleet that use a coal-fired power station to produce the electric in the first place. So renewable energy is key to uh, delivering a zero emission fleet. Um, Next slide, please. So the fuel cell bus, however, uses hydrogen and it's a slightly more complex process, uh, initially at least. So again, we use renewable energy, which uh, uh, operates through an electrolyzer. Uh, the electrolyzer converts water to its constituent parts, which is hydrogen and oxygen. In this case, we'll be taking the hydrogen element and it will be compressed and stored on a multi-element gas container, which is a, a large trailer type vehicle, which will then be brought to our, our dispensing facility, uh, in this case, Newton Abbey Depot, where we'll dispense into uh, the bus. Interestingly, dispensing of the energy from a, a, in the fuel cell system is about a 10 minute process, uh, whereas the battery charging process is, is four hours. So there's two distinct processes that we need to uh, consider there. But going back to the idea of renewables, by developing these systems and becoming uh, early uh, adopters of this technology, we are helping to provide resilience within that renewable energy uh, uh, space because the people who are going to generate the electricity require the customers to, to use that electricity. And by doing this, we are providing that sort of incentivization to start that process and, 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 and uh, really get it up and running. Next slide, please. So just a wee bit about the vehicles themselves. Um, the range of a battery electric vehicle is determined by the size of its battery pack. However, the battery packs themselves have a, 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 a weight and the, have, the bigger they are, the heavier they get. So there is a bit of a trade-off between battery storage capacity and, and passenger capacity. Uh, we, the vehicles still have to meet the, the build regulations, albeit that zero emission vehicles do have a, a, an improved axle load, which allows them to be a bit heavier, uh, but it does have an impact on the passenger car ability if we go too heavy. Um, in terms of processes, the vehicles need to be charged and ready for service. So, but as you can imagine, Vehicles come in with different states of charge. They come in at different times of night and they're going out at different times of the day. And as I said earlier, it takes around four hours. So there's there's a new process that we'll have to develop and deliver in terms of how we schedule and charge the vehicles so that they're each each vehicle is available and ready for the service that is, is uh, assigned to go on. Um, next slide. So the battery electric design, this is, this is just to give you a little impression of, of what uh, right bus here, the manufacturers of the vehicles we're going to buy have been doing. So this little cutaway schematic shows the layout of the uh, battery distribution. So it's, it's a, a 340 kilowatt battery pack for those of you who are interested in the, some of the, the, the statistics. Um, and as you can see, right bus have worked very hard to package those battery components, which are the pink boxes, in areas that will not affect the or encroach into the passenger space. So there's very little intrusion and indeed it'll look very much like a, a, a diesel a bus uh, and also feel very much like a diesel bus in terms of, of capacity and size. So it, it has been a nice piece of work carried out by Red Bus. 
minimum range of these vehicles will be 140 miles, and I think Sarah will touch a wee bit on, on those sorts of aspects uh, later in terms of operation. Next slide, please. So the fuel cell, the, the traction provided uh, on a fuel cell bus is very similar to that on an electric bus. The, the difference is that whilst the energy is stored on the batteries on the uh, electric bus, the energy is stored on hydrogen in the fuel cell bus and is passed through uh, a piece of equipment called the fuel cell to create electricity on water, uh, which is what you get from the exhaust at the end of a, uh, the operation. And uh, those vehicles, as I said, 10 minute charge on up to 200 mile range. So a different different style of vehicle to the electric vehicle and has different horses for different courses, as they say. Next slide, please. So just to summarize where we think uh, zero emissions vehicles will, will get us to, if we're using fuel that's linked to renewable supply, which is our intention, that's 100% carbon reduction. There's zero emission uh, exhaust emissions. The, the battery electric has no emission at the vehicle. And the fuel cell, as I said, has, has water uh, from the, from the uh, uh, exhaust. And it will help promote further investment, the whole renewable scene. Uh, uh, the adoption and deployment of renewable projects will, will gain legs the more people become uh, involved and interested in, in operating. Uh, zero emission vehicles. It'll also help create an impetus to development of the idea of capacity switching and smart grid. And by that I mean when energy has been wasted at night because we don't have people using energy on your, your wind turbines can't therefore operate. You can now use these techniques such as battery storage and uh, hydrogen production to move the production uh, to, the tip, to the point where you can use the energy at the most efficient time. And I'll just pass on to Sarah now, who'll give a wee bit of a background of what we want to do operationally. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, as Ian and Brian touched on, um, my role within the project is largely in relation to business change and what elements within our current operation do we need to look at and review and ensure that they are ready for us to successfully deploy our zero emission vehicles. So in the next few slides, I'm just gonna take you through some of those elements and some of the decisions that we've had to work through to allow us to decide where we best place the vehicles and how we operate them most successfully just in the, the first phase um, of moving towards our, our net zero. So as a starting point, um, initially when receiving the, the funding for these vehicles, there was a few key operational considerations which we had to sit down and work through. Um, I've highlighted a couple of them here and a few you'll have picked up on as, as Brian has talked through the, the technology and the, the different fuel sources. So capital expenditure and running costs, um, I'll go through a bit more detail on that, but unlike your diesel vehicle, your, your battery electric and your hydrogen fuel cell vehicle are slightly more expensive, both in the initial outlay for purchase and also in running costs at the moment. In terms of infrastructure, um, you do need to have certain elements of infrastructure within your depot or wherever you're planning to stable and maintain your vehicles in order to support them. So as Brian has touched on your, your um, battery electric charging points and your hydrogen refueling station. Um, vehicle capability was a, a key consideration which we had to work through and really that was how we were gonna deploy our vehicles within our current network and what routes and uh, various elements played into that. So again, I'll touch on that in a bit more detail as we move forward. And then really some of the other elements around where at the moment would we make most impact in terms of assisting in climate change and focusing our efforts in areas where there may be some higher concerns around air quality. So no surprise, obviously, in the first leg of our journey, we're looking at city centre type environments and focusing our efforts in Belfast in the first instance and moving on to Derry and Londonderry for the next phase. We also wanted to, to try and use this as an opportunity to focus on areas where we knew that there would be demand and we knew that there was opportunity for growth, albeit that has slightly been relayed with COVID, but we hope as we build back responsibly and safely that those areas will continue to, to demonstrate the need for improvement and we'll, we'll start to, to build back some growth. 
Um, and some of the bottom bullet points there you can see in terms of fleet age, there's an opportunity here with bringing in a particularly new fleet into Belfast. There's an opportunity to disperse some of our younger fleet around the province and ensure that we're helping um, have the newest um, and cleanest fleet out and around other regions within the province. And we're very much with this project trying to get out and ahead of some of the regulatory standards, which we know will come into play over the next while. We are going to get to a point in time where you're just no longer able to procure a diesel vehicle. And therefore, it's essential for us, particularly with 1,400 uh, vehicles out on the road that we, we start to get um, into the way of this type of technology and bringing it in. And we also wanted to assist with reducing congestion, particularly in those city centre environments. And we're hoping that this project is a good catalyst along with our colleagues in, in the Department of Infrastructure to bring about some improved bus priority measures and um, some of the uh, road infrastructure elements that will certainly complement the use of the vehicles. And finally, this as with anything that TransLink does, comes in partnership with a few other large projects that we currently have um, at the moment. So it runs alongside a programme for low emission vehicles, which is largely targeting um, Ulster bus coach type fleet and uh, single deck and double deck vehicles, which will be brought in across our Ulster bus network, which are all Euro 6 capable. Um, and it also complements our new future ticketing program, which we have running at the moment as well, whereby some of the features within these new zero emission vehicles will allow us to move towards that account based type ticketing model. Thanks, Claire. If you could flick on to the next one, please. So again, just to give you a few of the, the finer detail in terms of a, a good comparator for both vehicle types. As Brian touched on, we're procuring 100 in total, 20 of which will be our hydrogen fuel cell and 80 will be our battery electric vehicles. And a few of these statistics will probably help you in the understanding as to how that split in numbers has came about. You can see with the battery electric, um, currently around 400 or so of those vehicle types within operation in the UK at the moment. So certainly in comparison to the 20 hydrogen fuel cells, uh, the battery electric is much more readily um, in use at the moment. As I said, the, the cost of both types of technology is slightly greater at the outset, um, approximately 1.8 um, times higher than the diesel for your battery electric and about 2.4 times higher than your diesel for the hydrogen fuel cell. So again, that's something to consider in your initial outlay and spend. Operational costs, um, your, your, your battery electric is much more comparable to the diesel um, and there's not a great deal of difference in that, whereas we do recognise that the hydrogen fuel cell has a slightly higher operational cost. I should say though, with both those elements, we are hopeful that as this type of technology is used more widely and as the market is stimulated a bit, particularly in the area of hydrogen um, and it becomes more popular in the demand, um, increases, we hope to see some of those costs reducing. For any of the operators out there, I suppose these next few are the key, the key ones. Um, if you're looking for a vehicle that is um, very similar to your diesel bus, then your, your fuel cell or your hydrogen bus is, is the one to go for. Your range is in and around the 20, or sorry, 200 to 220 miles on a full tank of hydrogen, which is, um, uh, pretty much equivalent to your diesel and would allow us within certainly our Belfast Metro network to complete a full duty cycle without too much trouble. And in terms of refuel in six to 10 minutes, which again is, is much similar to what we're used to. And it gives you much more flexibility in terms of operations. Um, your battery electric on the other hand, slightly reduced your range in and around the 130 to 150 mile mark. And there are lots of, um, things to consider which can impact upon the range. So, you know, your heating on board, the number of passengers that you're carrying on board, the weight of the vehicle, all those type of things come into play, um, the type of route that you're operating on. And as Brian touched on, obviously the recharging takes longer. So you're looking between sort of three to six hours um, with some options out there for fast charging as well, if you have the, the appropriate uh, energy supply for that. Um, so a little bit more limited and a bit more constrained in terms of the flexibility that you have operationally. And as Brian touched on, there are some modifications needed in terms of the infrastructure of your depot with both your hydrogen refueling station and your battery electric chargers. 
Next slide, Claire, please. So in, in terms of the nuts and bolts then and, and where over the next year you're going to start to see these vehicles rolling out within Belfast, as I said, um, our, our first effort will be within our metro, our Belfast metro network. Um, and looking particularly at the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, we will have 20 of those vehicles along with an additional three, which we currently have out in service since the tail end of last year, which were three pilot vehicles um, supported by the Office of Low Emissions. Um, these will be stabled in our Newton Abbey depot um, predominantly with a few in our Mild Water Service Centre um, site in Duncrew. And the aim at the moment would be that we will fully convert a corridor on our existing network, which is our Antrim Road corridor operating through North Belfast. Um, the reason that we have opted for that area, I suppose you can see highlighted in the hexagons there on the slide, um, the length of that particular route, um, some of the longest extremities on that route, you're talking about sort of a 20 mile round trip from the city centre. Uh, and that in turn makes the duty cycles quite lengthy on that. Likewise, the topography, um, if anybody that's familiar with the city will know that you're on a gradual climb when you head out of Belfast up the Antrim Road. So you need a vehicle that has the capability of doing that. And unfortunately, the battery electric just wouldn't, wouldn't have been the one for that at this point in time. The route itself, th there is opportunities there. Prior to COVID, as I said, we, we've seen good growth on the Antrim Road and we had already started some work around bus stop rationalisation and around some work in terms of getting um, some improved bus infrastructure along that corridor. So hopefully our, our zero emission technology in that area will help bring a bit of impetus to that and help improve that. The other thing which we had had undertaken at the very outset is some route modelling around this and this has been helped by um, WTEC and some of the students at Queen's University. So they were able to apply some science behind where we proposed to place these vehicles and ran a number of tests for us just to simulate lengths of journeys, um, a, bus, a bus fully laden, a bus half laden, um, numbers of duty cycles, the length of time, the length of time the bus was out of the depot, just to give us a wee bit of confidence that the vehicles themselves could actually manage the routes that we were suggesting. So we're confident that this is going to work well for us um, for our first uh, fully converted zero emission corridor. Next slide, please, Claire. In terms of the battery electric then, we have a, a much bigger number of battery electric vehicles. So we have 80 that we're going to deploy again within Belfast. And we're going to stable those across two of our existing sites. So both our Short Strand and My Water Service Centre depot, we will have a, a 35-45 split respectively. We hope that by utilising these two depots, we'll be able to again adopt a fully converted zero emission route or a fully converted battery electric route. And we're going to try that on our Hollywood Road, Castle Ray Road and Craiga Road within the east of the city. Um, largely again for similar reasons, those particular routes are quite short in length. They're reasonably flat journeys. And again, when we have done those through some of our route modeling, we've realized that they would suit the nature of the, the battery electric vehicle. We're also tying that in with some um, uh, proposed improvements in the area, which we know about, like Satilli's Burn Park and Ride, and a few public realm schemes in the Castle Ray Road. So we hope there's, there's opportunities for a quality bus corridor type notion to operate there. But we estimate that those three corridors would utilise about 30 vehicles a day out of the 80. So the remaining 50 that we have, we are going to try and utilise across the entire Belfast Metro network where practicable. So where we have a particularly um, low mileage journey or running board or duty, as we would call it, we're going to utilise those battery electric vehicles on. So it's fair to say you'll see a good touch of them throughout the city. OK, Claire, next slide for me, please. So taking that all into account, really, um, I suppose the benefits of the project as a whole, um, as I see them, or I suppose as a, as a good way to, to cover off, um, I would see them in four different sectors. So we have environmental benefits, we have economic benefits, we have the improvement for the customer and the customer experience. And also it ties into some of the programme for governance and some of our business's strategic objectives that Ian has set out. 
So in terms of the environmental, um, it's clean air transport. Some of the statistics that Ian shared at the start of the slide, these will very much be the first steps towards improved air quality and the reduced greenhouse gases. Um, the renewable and sustainable fuel sources, as Brian touched on, so it's something that um, everyone will be moving toward in the not too distant future and something that's sustainable for us in the long term. And we hope by targeting some of the areas where we can hopefully get a bit of traction on improved road infrastructure, we can help with reductions in congestion and hopefully incentivize people with a nice new vehicle and particularly those that are climate conscious to make that shift from the private car into more public or active travel. In terms of the economy, you, you've probably picked up on a few of these things if we went through, but keeping the economy on the move, particularly in the ch challenging COVID environment that we're in at the moment, um, you know, we have procured these vehicles with a local supplier through Right Bus, and we work in collaboration with a, a number of local parties, um, NIE, for example, and certainly working along with Energia and Logans and different stakeholders that have been involved in the programme to date. Um, and it is definitely a step in driving some of the hydrogen economy that's out there. So as I touched on when we moved through, in order to stimulate that market, it requires people to buy into it and it'll have the added benefit for everybody at the end when we can see some um, improvements in supply and reduction in cost. And obviously the improvements in and around health. In terms of customer experience, uh, the vehicles themselves are high spec, um, lots of additional bells and whistles on them, um, you know, nice leather at seats, USB charging. They will be double door, which is new to Belfast um, and have lots of improved features for passenger comfort. As I touched on improved bus priority and enhancements in accessibility, there's also a number of new safety features on board. Um, and obviously that's a plus uh, and we've a new ticketing system, which is coming on board as well in the middle of this year. Um, and finally, then, in terms of strategy, uh, a couple of the targets that Ian had touched on in terms of reduction in our greenhouse gases, we aim to reduce by 50 percent by 2030 and a full zero emission fleet within our foil and Belfast metro networks by that stage as well. And that's helping us move on that path to our 2040 net zero. OK, Claire, next slide. I'm not going to labour this one in detail. I'm conscious of time for us today. I would just pick out the few key key target dates on that timeline and ones just to bring your mind back to what we've already discussed. So our, our first three hydrogen vehicles, which we have out in the road at the tail end of last year, moving towards the implementation of our further 100 zero emission buses, which will be on the road in spring 22. Um, moving us then on to the 2030 landmark where we hope to have our Belfast metro network and our foil metro network fully zero emission um, and that then to our longer term goal of our 2040 net zero. And I'll wrap up there Claire and move on if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much to the three of you for for this presentation. That that's uh, personally that's a that's a project that I've been really really interested in in knowing more about. So uh, thank you so much for all the all those details and all, all these this information. We have time maybe for a couple of questions from the audience. So I'm just going to read uh, some of those that I have received. Um, with regards to the electric vehicles, do you know how the range will uh, increase over the in the coming years and will the current order of vehicles be able to be retrofitted with newer battery packs uh, with a greater range? Do you want to pack that one up, Brian? Yeah, um, as the vehicles age, the, battery pack, the batteries themselves will actually uh, reduce in efficiency, but the range that we have adopted as, as the standard for, uh, as uh, Sarah was talking about earlier there, that's the range we expect all the way through battery life. The battery life is about seven years. The only way that we can adopt uh, improved uh, capacity of batteries going forward will be as, as battery uh, power density improves, which has been the case. So it is, it is entirely possible that going forward, 
that we will be able to retrofit with batteries that will give us longer range purely on the basis that the technology will move forward and improve the, the power density of the battery. Great, thank you. Have you benefited from... That's me finished. Okay, yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, have you benefited, or has TransLink benefited from funding uh, support opportunities and in, while I'm on the finance side, have another question. Will your supplier or suppliers cover the cost of infrastructure and you buy fuel contracts? Um, on that, Geraldine, yes, we look, the, the transition from fossil fuels to zero emission is very much sponsored by um, Department for Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, also, as part of New Decade, New Approach, um, the, there, there was additional money identified for, for zero emission vehicles in that, which, is, which has both of those elements have facilitated this major step forward towards zero emissions. In terms of infrastructure, that has, that has had to be formed a significant part of our business case. The infrastructure costs associated with that that transition are significant as well. So we have to modify our depots. Uh, we didn't cover that so much in the presentation, but that is a, a major factor in, in this, as well as what Sarah's covered, which, which is you, you can change the technology, but you also have to change your working practices and also develop your staff, and that's a key element of the of the uh, program. Sorry, did I miss an element of that? The question. Um, no. Will you? Uh, how will the relationship with your supplier work? Will you buy some fuel contracts, or and the supplier will, no, will they, finance they, they the, the infrastructure? No, the, the procurement strategy that we've adopted is that we, we, um, we're currently going through a procurement process for the infrastructure for both the electric vehicles and the hydrogen vehicles. Um, we procure the vehicles under framework contracts, which have been subject to separate public procurement. And hydrogen uh, fuel supply will be subject to a separate uh, procurement process later on this year. Great. Um, one other question, maybe before we wrap up. What would you say was the was the biggest challenge, or maybe that that hasn't been solved yet? But what would you say is the biggest challenge to um, completing successfully this project? I I think the the fact that you know as as a as a public transport operator historically we have always tried to deal with proven technology, off the shelf product, and and very much had a conservative approach to you know having certainty and and when we transition to to new new vehicles or new infrastructure or new operation the the necessity because of the reasons that we outlined in the presentation you know climate change air pollution and actually some of the post covid issues that's that has um driven us into a position where we're now having to deal with leading edge technology. The complexity of these projects, the fact that we're now dealing with multiple suppliers and supply chains that are in different levels of maturity, it's that it's that program complexity is the single biggest challenge that we have to deal with. Multi multiple stakeholders in, involved in this, where our historic bus programs, for example, would, would have significantly fewer. So it's program complexity and the sheer scale of the number of stakeholders we have to deal with. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ian, Brian, and Sarah. That was that was a really, really interesting presentation. I I think we will be able to share the slides uh, to to with the audience uh, when uh, in in the follow up email. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but we had a lot coming through in the in the questions box. So, um, well, if you have any any specific question, uh, we will we will forward them uh, to to our guest speakers today. Um, I will just wrap up now. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar this afternoon. Um, we have one final one that's coming up next week uh, on Tuesday at two o'clock. Um, we will hear from Lidl and Deloitte on climate conscious uh, consumption. 
uh, with Lidl presenting what they have done in their supermarkets to reduce their direct emissions. So uh, although that, that is happening in supermarkets, it's applicable to, to any organization with, with uh, physical assets. And we'll hear from Deloitte on, on how we make our sustainable uh, consumption choices uh, as consumers. So I think it's going to be a really interesting one. Uh, thank you, everyone. Do get in touch with us if you are interested in starting your climate journey, signing our Climate Action Pledge. Uh, we are here to answer any questions you might have. So you can reach us at environment at bitcni.org.uk. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.